Alright, start again. Alright. You ever have a teacher in school that did a lot of reviews, uh, like especially in math class, they would introduce a new concept and then at the end of the class they would hand out worksheets and so you did multiplication, division, all that kind of stuff over and over again. Or in English class, you might be talking about some literature thing or uh, some something, but she would always end with some grammar worksheets to do her for homework or some, some vocabulary. Now, the point of that was what? You have to learn the basics, right? You have to get them down because everything else builds on them, particularly in math, right? Uh, you know, you, you can't do upper higher level math if you don't know your math multiplication tables or your division facts. And you can't write a good paper if you don't know grammar and spelling. So lots of repetition on the basics over and over and over again until it's just second nature, right? Well, what's true in our school days is also true in the Christian life. Jesus works us through the basics over and over and over again because we can't move on to the deeper things of God if we don't understand and apply and live out the basics. Uh, I'm frequently surprised just how many times I have to go back through Christianity 101 again and again and again. It's not that I don't really know the concepts, but applications is sometimes is pretty tricky sometimes. And so we need to go back over it again and apply and learn to apply those truths that we know in our head when they're second nature. James 1.22 says it's like this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And that's pretty plain. What he's saying there is not just enough to listen to the word or to go to sermons or read books or listen to podcasts or whatever. Uh, we, because when we listen but don't act on it, James says we are living in a state of deception. So it's essential that we learn to follow through and actually do what the word says. So the good news is that we're not the only ones who need work on the basics. Jesus' disciples had to go through a lot of worksheets over and over and over again to learn how to trust him. And so we've already seen the pattern of teaching, testing for the purpose of trusting show up twice in the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to see that happen again today. And if you have your timeline that we gave out before, and if you don't have one, it's on the, the back a stand back there, but this is just gives you an overview of where we are in Jesus' three years of ministry. You see, the gray part here is what is covered in the Gospel of Mark, and so today we are going to be up to the end of the second year of Jesus' ministry and the beginning of the third year, and so uh, we're up to chapter 7, and it starts out at the places that we've seen before. And this is conflict with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And uh, remember that they're following him around now, looking for a reason to accuse him, for a reason to get rid of him, so they can have him executed and get out of their hair and stop messing up their system. So uh, let's just look at teaching as it centers around this conflict of the day. And it starts right here, the teaching portion of what Jesus is going to do in Mark chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. So the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, came from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. Now this isn't actual dirt or grime that's on their hands, but they're really talking about ceremonial washing. That is, they actually washed their hands with something that looked like this, a two-handled pot and they would, uh, uh, would fill it with water and they would pour over one hand twice and then they would take the other handle and pour over the other hand twice and they would say a prayer, a ritual prayer over the top of it every time that they did that and this was particularly when they would eat food that had bread as a part of the meal. Now remember Mark's Jew audience is not Jewish, they're Gentiles, so he explains this to him in verses three and four and talks to them about these uh, these traditions that the Pharisees had created. If you remember that we've talked to about before is that they imposed their laws, their traditions on people in Israel as if they were the same as the law of Moses ha uh, handed down at Mount Sinai. And but, uh, but the law of Moses doesn't command any kind of ceremonial 
hand washing like they were doing here. This was just an added rule that they had made up throughout the generations. Uh, the only washing that the law of Moses talks about is priests before they entered the tabernacle. But this not for just the general population, not for eating or anything like that. And so, but the Pharisees and teachers of law are irritated at Jesus because he doesn't follow their rules. And so they come to him and ask Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? And Jesus gets really upset with them and gets in their faces about this hypocrisy, this whole uh, emphasis on the outside when they didn't care about what was going on the inside. And so Jesus quotes Isaiah here, verses 6 through 8, and he applies it to the people who are asking these questions. And says, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And so they had lost the understanding of what the law of, of God was about. And they had elevated these other rules up to the equal to or even above, in some cases, the actual law of God. So uh, he keeps going on about this and but kind of summarizes it in verse 14 when he says, listen to me. This He's talking to the crowds, including the, the scribes and Pharisees. And understand this, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of the man that makes him unclean. So this is clear teaching here. What's on the outside doesn't defile a person, but what is on the inside is what Jesus is saying here. But this was radical to the, the people that he was talking to who had been taught their whole lives about the importance of keeping the outside looking good. That if you want God to like you and God to be uh, his favor to shine on you, you have to work really hard on doing all this stuff on the outside, including all of the laws that they had piled on top of the law of Moses. And so after this... Uh, teaching to the whole group, the disciples talked to Jesus in private, and they asked him, so basically they're asking, what, 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 what does that mean? What are you talking about? And Jesus says, are you so dull, he asked. And this basically he's separating them from the crowds and the Pharisees, and he's saying, you too? You don't get it? After all this time, it's two years that you've been following me around and listening to my teachings, don't you see how different what I say is about the kingdom of God than what you've been taught all along? And then he reiterates what he said in the group session with them and says what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. And he has this whole list of stuff here about uh, um, this list of sins here for what comes within, for, for from within, out of men's hearts comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. And so um, he said, see, we don't really get this today, but he was directly countering the whole teaching of the Pharisees and the scribes and the culture that they were steeped in, which told them you have to be meticulously careful about the outside, what you eat, what you touch, where you go, who you talk to, how far you stay away from these people, what you say, what you don't say, and then you had to go through all these rituals if you actually do something wrong to become clean again. And then, But he says that um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, then he says, all these come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, he's talking about, uh, the point is obvious that the root of sin is within us. In the unregenerate heart is the source of defilement. Outside influences from our environment can tempt us. Our upbringing can predispose us to certain behaviors or certain, certain responses. But the problem at its root is our heart. Right? And just for the record, if you're thinking, well, you know, I don't find myself a lot in these, this list here. You're thinking especially murder and maybe adultery. You remember in other parts of the gospel, Jesus raises the bar on what those are about. Because he says if you hate your brother, that's like murder. Or if you have lust in your heart, that's like the sin of adultery. And many times throughout the whole scripture that... Uh, idolatry is is coupled with adultery. It's spiritual adultery. So 
Even if you're going to eliminate those two things, everybody has evil thoughts, greed, deceit, envy, arrogance, and uh, all of us find ourselves in this list here. This isn't a hierarchy of which one is worse. This is all, all of them in the same basket there. And this list in the verses 20 and 20, 21 and 22 are the fruits of evil and wickedness that reside within the hearts of those who don't know Jesus. That, what, that is what makes people unclean before God, not what is out here, not what we're doing on the outside. Now, we need, do need to be careful about holiness and what we get involved in. That's not giving us license to do whatever we want to do. But the heart is the matter. It's not what's out there. It's what's in here. It's what Jesus is saying. And we always start out the same way, unrighteous before God. Romans 3.10, as it's written, there's no one righteous not even one. And so you're thinking about some nice person out there who you know who is kind and helpful, but they're of another faith or they're of no faith at all. And what may be because they're helpful and they're generous, that maybe God will accept them. That's not true. All have sinned. All of us start out with an evil, unbelieving heart that is bent away from from God. If you see Ephesians chapter 2, this long passage here from what, verses 1 to 3 tells us what it's like for people without Christ. That is, that we are dead in sin, following the ways of the world. Satan has free reign in their lives, and life is all about satisfying our earthly and fleshly cravings, and in worst of all, we are objects of the wrath of God. This is a desperate, desperate condition. And if you don't know if Jesus is your Savior, you are not okay. No matter how good and all the stuff on the outside that you do, how nice you are, you are not okay. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's on the inside that makes us clean before God. And Scripture is clear that the heart is evil and against God until we allow Christ to give us a transplant. And when we do realize our situation and that we can't save ourselves and we call out to Jesus in faith, this is God's response from Ezekiel 36, 26. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit, and remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That is a fantastic miracle that moves us from the state of being dead to being alive, out from under the wrath of God, and into his family. Doesn't mean all those desires and those tendencies we had before salvation just disappear. Uh, the flesh is still very, very active. We might have to battle and work and yield and surrender over and over and over again, do a whole lot of worksheets from Jesus about working that stuff out of us, but the change that happens on the inside is once and for all, death to life. Hallelujah, right? That's a wonderful, wonderful miracle. So Jesus finishes up this private teaching session with his disciples. And uh, so it's, that's over. And so now he's ready to leave and head off for a vacation time. And now there's a lot of thoughts about this, this part of this, uh, Mark chapter 6 and, and that in the commentaries and uh, how Jesus interacts with this woman. And that we're about to meet. Uh, she is a nameless woman, by the way. And just like before, I like to give the nameless people uh, uh, some names. It's easier to talk about them. And this is Tyra because she is from the city of Tyre. So we're about to meet her in, in a minute. But um, these commentaries I read were wide ranging about what they talk, thought about this story and what's going on here. Some ha I thought had merit, some. I don't know. <laughs> but most of them focus, focus solely on Tyra and what's going on there. But the one group of people that almost all of the con commentaries that I read ignored is the disciples. And I think that they're really important to understanding this story because the pattern is once again repeated that we talked about before. Teaching, testing for the purpose of trusting. And so the disciples now have heard Jesus teach on what is the difference between clean and unclean three times. You know, once in a group session and twice privately, he has told them what it means to be clean before God. Now, that's really important to understanding this interaction with Tyra here. So, he's about to give them a test, and he says, okay, Jesus left the place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. 
So he tells the guys we need to get away from some R&R, &R, and we can get away from these crowds, and he takes them on this vacation and heads off to the city of Tyre. Now, uh, this map just tells you where it, where it is. They're down here at the Sea of Galilee. Tyre and Sidon is way up here. That's about 35 miles from where they were. 11 to 12 hours of straight walking, if it was on flat land, which it wasn't. So this is not just a day hike. It took them a while to get from one place to the other. This is also the first time Mark records Jesus leaving Palestine to enter a Gentile region, uh, uh, an, uh, an area that, by the way, would have been avoided by any kind of devout Jew because um, the uh, religious Jews would just not have gone here, especially not to go on vacation and to get away from everything. Because a lot of times when we're reading the Bible, we see place names and we don't think about how they relate to them. But it is, this is huge in understanding this story because this is a shocking vacation spot for them because the Gentiles were considered by Jews to be unclean. Okay, so this is why the, where the test is coming on. So the whole city of Tar would have been considered unclean, not a place for any kind of respectable Jew, especially not a rabbi, to go. So he enters, he goes to the city of Tar, he enters a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. So his fame and all the stuff that's been going on around the miracles and everything that he has been doing for two years, has spread this far. They know who he is, too. So they go to get, get settled in at their Airbnb and try to lay low, but the word gets out that Jesus is nearby, and pretty quickly there's a knock on the door, and as soon as she, that is Tyra, heard about him, she, she, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. So in comes Tyra, and so look what Mark says about her in the next verse. The woman was Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, the Matthew version of this says Cana uh, a Canaanite woman, but it's the same place. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. So this Greek woman, a.k.a. Gentile, uh, not Jewish, falls down at the feet of Jesus uh, on, on the floor in front of him. Maybe she even touches his feet, and then she asks him to drive the demon and heal her out, of his, out of her daughter and heal her. Her. And at this point, the disciples' prejudice has to be kicking in. Shock, irritation, disgust, lots of stuff happening in there. Who is this woman? What is she doing? Doesn't she know who the, Jesus is a rabbi? She can't come up to him like that. All this stuff is flooding their minds. And uh, if you compare this to the Matthew account in chapter 15, it says after, after the woman comes in and asks Jesus to heal her daughter, it says... Jesus did not answer a word. So there's got to be this huge tension building in the room there. From our vantage point, without thinking through it, it seems like maybe he's ignoring her or something. And that's what some of the commentators said, that he was just kind of not waiting for her to answer and kind of not paying attention to her. But I'm not sure so that was a lack of response to her. Rather, I think he was waiting for a response from the disciples. Maybe he turned and looked at, at them. May, uh, he didn't say anything. Maybe they assumed that his silence meant that Jesus was on their side, that they were, he was thinking the way they were, uh, and that he didn't want to deal with this woman because, after all, they're there for a vacation and for rest. And this is a Greek woman, by the way. We don't want her here. And so that would have certainly made sense to them. And then there's this, like, group confrontation around Jesus where it says in the same uh, chapter of Matthew, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. They want to get rid of her and make her be quiet. You know, she's bothering us, Jesus. She's bothering you. Let's just get rid of her. We're supposed to be resting here kind of idea. And at this point, the test for the disciples is over. They have failed once again. And this is where they were supposed to apply the lesson on clean and unclean, right? It isn't what goes into your body that makes you clean or unclean. Remember, Jesus just said that. It, it, but what comes out of it, that's what on the inside makes you clean or unclean before before God. And remember that? Like we said this like three times, like uh, yesterday. So he's like, okay, keep on working on it. 
But see, the application here should have been that the disciples recognize that, that it isn't where this woman is from that limits her access to God, right? That would be an external thing like food. It's what's on, in, on the inside of her that draws her near to God, i.e. her faith. And that's the difference. If she has what's right on the inside of her, so the outside doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where she's from. It doesn't matter that she was Greek or was Jew or Roman or whatever. It's what happens on the inside. That is the essence of the gospel right there. Salvation is open to all people. Yes, first to the Jews at this point, but Jesus never turned away a seeking heart. It didn't matter where they were from. Here's a perfect example of that. And he interacts with Romans. He interacts with lepers and tax collectors and all of these people. He responds to the faith that people come to him in. And he willingly accepts them all. So the disciples missed it completely. In fact, they won't truly understand this and get this concept till much later on. So now the test is over for the disciples, and so he turns to Tyra. It is time for her test. And so we go into verse 26. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And he says, first let the little children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Now, the word dog there is significant because uh, the kind of dog that the Bible usually talks about is not fuzzy pets. It's normally scavenger dogs, which would be worse than strays. They were pack animals. They were vicious. They were not, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to mess with them at all. And that's what um, the Bible usually used is for the term dog there. They're not friendly. There was not a good connotation. Now, she would have understood the word dog because that is what Jews called Gentiles. So she, if she had ever had any interaction with Jews at all, they called Gentiles the scavenger dogs. So it was definitely a derogatory word that she would have been familiar with. Now you're thinking, wow, Jesus, dog, really? I mean, but we lose the essence of how he's conversing with her because of the difference between English and Greek. Uh, so he didn't use the same word for scavenger dog here. He did pick out the word dog that does mean fuzzy pet. It means the little uh, house pet that children would have, that they would play with. It, it literally means little dog. And it was a term of affection, not this, this hostile and harsh term that the Jews would use for Gentiles. And I think that he was trying to draw her out to see, have a conversation with her to see what her faith was made of. And so what she says here after that says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. So she hung in there with Jesus, received the answer she was looking for. Disciples failed their test, but Tyra passed. She got past with flying colors. She didn't have nearly as much teaching as they had, but what she did know was enough for her to trust him. And she already knew about him. She came to Jesus with sincere faith and looking for a miracle. But what she, what she left with, remember from a few weeks ago, we said that Jesus always gives more. Well, she left with not just healing for her daughter, but she left with a deep abiding faith in Jesus. And that's the point, right? Whatever we hear teaching, we should always be ready to apply it to whatever we encounter and whatever we face, whatever we run into, whatever happens, it ought to push us toward trusting the Savior more deeply. If we come across something that happens and we find ourselves pulling back from Jesus, but we fail the test of what the point is, and so we should learn to reach out and move forward toward Jesus just like she did. So, what do we learn from this story that leads us toward trusting? Two things for our takeaway as we kind of wrap up this chapter here. And the first one is, there are no formulas with God. This is our uh, lessons from Tyre. There's no formula it's from God. Now, this isn't directly in the story, but kind of a larger principle that kind of has emerged as we move through the Gospel of Mark. And you see where we are. Uh, um, and, you know, there aren't any formulas with God. But, you know, we really like formulas. We really like them a lot. We want our relationship with Jesus to be 
predictable, right? That's why people gravitate toward religious rules and in that are in some denominations or in some faiths. Uh, they are predictable, right? You do this at this time, on this day, you say these things, you go here, you do that, and then you can expect things to happen this way. That's the way you're told it. Uh, but uh, we like that because it's manageable, right? We know what to expect. A plus B equals C all the time, every time. But we like that because who, puts, who is in charge if God is a formula? Not God, it's us, right? Because uh, it, if I do this thing, then I expect God to do that thing. Now, of course, that doesn't work if you've ever tried that, but that's what we're trying to get out of that. And that's why you, 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 you see people gravitating for, toward uh, you know, popular books or things that go, oh, well, just do this, and then God will answer your prayer like that. Because we're looking for a formula. We're looking for a way to manage our faith, to manage God, and get him to do what we want him to do. Uh, you know, like prayer plus witnessing equals a blessing, or faith plus service equals answered prayer. Whatever, whatever you want in the, that equation, we're trying to find a way to make it work out the way we want to. But that sucks the life out of a relationship, doesn't it? We don't need to bother getting to know God at all if he's a formula. I just do the stuff and get the answer I want. But like I said, it does not work if you've ever tried that. Uh, Jesus does not play that game. He deals with us uniquely as an individual. That's why we call it a relationship and not religion. Relationships don't have formulas. If you, you, They are dynamic and change and grow. And your relationship with your mom is very different from your dad, right? Your relationship with your, if you have multiple children, each one is different, right? Or with, you don't talk to your sister the way that talk, you talk to your boss, do you? They are radically different. And because, and because it's a relationship that Jesus wants, it means it differs from person to person to person. What he does for one doesn't necessarily do for the other. How he deals with us varies and sometimes varies widely. Remember Scarlet, the woman with the issue of blood? She interacted with Jesus by following at his feet and touching the hem of his garment. Here, Tyra has a conversation before she gets what she is asking him for. If you did a study of how Jesus interacts with blind people in the New Testament, it's basically all different. One he heals by speaking to him. Another he touches. Another he spits in the dirt and makes mud and puts it on his face. Why the difference? I mean, it looks like the same thing on the outside to us, right? But he's dealing with individuals. It may appear that the conditions are the same on the outside, but Jesus is always looking beneath the surface. That's why we have to caution ourselves by looking around at others and comparing our situations to somebody else's and being disappointed, going, God, well, you gave her the job or the husband or the healing or you fixed the thing in her life. Why won't you do it for me? And he does something for them and not for us or vice versa because he's dealing with things we can't see. He deals with stuff that's on the inside. And he deals with us, like I said, as individuals because it is a relationship. So health, ed health issues, adversity, relationship problems of all sorts. He's working on us all the time. Sometimes he takes things away for one. Sometimes he leaves things in place for another to get at things in our lives that sometimes we don't even realize are there. So there are no formulas with God. So the second thing we learn from Tyra is that encounters with Jesus are intended to transform us. Now a lot of times when we come to Jesus and we ask for something, we're just satisfied with getting the answer, aren't we? That's what the main thing we're after, right? I want the job, I want the relationship, I want that thing, I want you to stop this thing over here, I want you to avert this crisis or this disaster, and we're happy about it when he answers our prayers, right? And, but often it stops right there. Our desire terminates on the thing that we want, you know, and, and that's, and, but that's never God's intention. Yes, he's a kind and good God and gives us things that we want, but he wants something more than just giving us a gift. He, he, he does things that are amazing, but our joy and fulfillment and praise should not ever stop with just the answer. 
We ought not be satisfied to just go back to life as normal after he answers your prayer for us, right? Oh, yes, Jesus gave me what I asked for. He delivered me, restored, averted, changed, whatever. But besides being happy that it worked out, we aren't ever really changed. God's intentions with these encounters isn't ever, that isn't ever the point. It is to change us so we see him differently, so we have a more accurate picture of who he is. And that's what we see in Tyra. I don't believe Tyra ever was the same after this moment. Imagine what took place inside of her when she raced out of that house, flung open the doors at her house, and found her daughter relieved to her suffering. Do you think she ever forgot that? Do you think she ever just didn't talk about Jesus ever again? Yeah, she's, she's well. We're going on with our life. Same old, same old. I don't think so. I mean, they were both powerfully impacted by this woman's encounter with Jesus. She knew she had been with the Lord. She knew something dramatic had happened. He'd done a wonderful thing for her, and I don't think she kept quiet about it. And so sometimes we read a story in the Bible and we just read what's there. We don't ever think about what maybe happened afterwards. Now, if you remember the story of the woman at the well, the Bible tells us what happens after she encounters Jesus. And that is she ran back to her town, told everybody that would listen to her what happened, brought them out to meet Jesus. And eventually the whole town was saved and transformed by her interaction. And I think this may have been what happened with Tyra. As news began to spread, don't you know she had a story to tell and tell it often? I mean, people probably got sick of hearing it after a while, right? I mean, it's like she lived in a small community here on, on the edge of the sea here. People were coming and going all the time, and she was no doubt telling everybody, let me tell you about who Jesus is. Let me tell you about that miracle worker who was over there in Galilee who came to my town, and look what he did for me. Neighbors stopped by to see what was going on. They're like, hey, let have you heard about what happened to my daughter here? Uh, now, this is just conjecture uh, of, of, because the Bible doesn't really say it specifically, but I want you to sh I want to show you an obscure verse in the Bible and have you just think about it a little bit about what might have happened. So this is over in the book of Acts, and it's Acts 21, and this is a missionary journey by Paul. And it says in verse, 20, uh, verse 3 and 4 of, of Acts 21, after sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, south of it, we, that's Paul and his companions, sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Now, uh, it is, it is um, the implication here is, is that Paul and his companions were surprised to find disciples there. They weren't going to visit the disciples. They were going there to unload cargoes. Now, why in the world would there be disciples in Tyre at this point? There have been no missionary journeys yet here at all. In fact, if you look at the maps in the back of your Bible, this is the only time Paul, Paul ever shows up in the city of Tyre. Yet he finds disciples there. Matthew 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon and found Tyra. He lived in the vicinity. She came to him. Bible doesn't say it specifically, but it's reasonable to believe that the disciples in Tyre might have been there because of the faith of Tyre. Isn't that possible? Maybe even likely, Tyre was changed. She encountered Jesus here, heard what he said, believed enough to engage with him, and it impacted her. And it impacted her family. And maybe even impacted the whole community. And so years later, there were disciples perfectly positioned to minister and encourage the Apostle Paul and his companions. I love that. <laughs> I don't know if it happened like that, but I like to think it did. Um, so the lessons for us is that you get teaching. If you are engaged with the body of Christ in any way, even mildly, you're going to show up to teaching. That's Sunday morning church, that's Bible studies like this, this is small groups, this is books, this is podcasts, all kinds of things, tons of it. Teaching is everywhere in this culture. Um, you can find it everywhere. And with teaching will always come testing. Jesus is not going to just let us learn something and have it up in our heads, right? He wants to just to put it in our lives, just like James said, so that we live it out. 
And we get lots of review sheets, lots of worksheets in the Christian life. Uh, Paige, who's not here tonight, she's a teacher, a high school teacher, and she calls the test that she gives her students a celebration of learning. I love that term, right? I love that. If only we thought about our test from God as that, a celebration of learning. If we go, oh, I'm struggling through this thing, what's going on in your life? God's given me a celebration of learning right here. <laughs> I, so we need to keep that in our mind. I love that so much. But our, the response to our test should always be more trust. And the natural overflow of trust is shame. You don't stay the same after you learn really to trust Jesus more. If we never change, do you really know the gospel at all? Do you really know who Jesus is at all if you never change? If you're satisfied with where you are, has it really impacted you. Our encounters with Jesus should result in change. It might be two steps forward, one step back, just little bitty tiny changes, but we're moving in the direction of being conformed into his image. Our lives are altered. How we think, how we live, how we impact and uh, interact with others, trust in Jesus should transform uh, so you ought to look back, not 10 years ago, you ought to be able to look back two years ago and say, yeah, I can see the pattern of change in my life. And so um, answers from Jesus, when we pray and ask, it ought to draw us to love him and serve him and obey him and follow him and not just say thanks, but for us to change and allow him to grow us um, you know, start when you get an answer to prayer, start by giving thanks. So start by saying thank you for hearing me or allowing me to come into your presence. I mean, how many times do you pray, people pray for safe travel, right? I always do pray for safe travel. How many times do you go back and thank God when you arrive? A lot of people don't. It's like we just go back to the same old, same old. I mean, we ask for wisdom in a situation. We get it. We ought to go back and think, say, thank you, Jesus, that you gave me the answer I was asking for. It ought to change our perception of who God is and how we look at everything in the world. We need to speak up. We need to speak out. Let our witness impact the people around us. Because you don't know who's listening. Or how it will impact people we don't ever even talk to. Could be that uh, that wi our witness and testimony of Christ's work in our lives might be used in ways we can never imagine, never foresee, just like the disciples that were in Tyre. So crazy if that's the way that it actually unfolded. Tyra likely never understood or saw the big picture of what she was doing in sharing her faith. In Jesus. So let me just end, end, end with this verse from Matthew. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Not see your good works and praise you. They look past you. They see the good works done in Jesus' name. Look past you and praise your Father in heaven. Let that be said of all of us. Amen. God, we just thank you for um, this story. Tyra here and uh, her faith and that you tell us that how we're clean before you is by faith in your son. Thank you that you made the, the way clear for us through his sacrifice. Help us to trust you more. Help us to step out in faith and believe you and be drawn to you when you see, when we see the good works that you do in our lives. Let that translate to good works before men so that they too can know you as Savior and Lord. And it's his mighty name we pray.